We're going to start exactly on time this morning. <laughs> well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's a, uh, another winter day. <laughs> a day that the Lord has made, so we're going to rejoice and be glad in it. I'm going to share some uh, announcements with you to start with, and uh, this is our first uh, Sunday that for congregational singing. <laughs> I'm not sure I stopped, but anyway, uh, feel free, and uh, we're gonna. I know Janie's excited. Yes, I am. So, <laughs> shout out, worship as you would, and and uh, we're gonna thank the Lord. Uh, next, let's see, February 7th at 9 a.m., we're going to start a men's Sunday school class. I'm not sure where that's at. Down, downstairs? Oh, okay, in the youth house, okay. And remember our fifth Sunday giving. Um, we give our fifth Sunday offering to to someone in the community, some organization. And uh, we're always looking for people to donate to, organizations to donate to. So if you have any uh, recommendations or feedback for us, why well, we'd be glad to take that. So Pastor Sean, um, at the beginning of the year, ask us all to come up with a word that would uh, just be with us through the, the year and, and hopefully bring us into closer relationship with the Lord. And uh, I thought about it and prayed about it, and um, the one that the Lord gave me was focus. And... Uh, <clears throat> just thought about my own personal faith and my own personal walk with the Lord, and uh, it seemed like focus was what I needed. I think we all need that. And if we uh, want help with that, uh, God's word gives us a good, good help. Matthew 14.6, um, uh, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life and no man comes to the father except through me if you really knew me you would know my father as well from now on you do know him and have seen him you know that's a verse that uh, separates the sheep from the goats and it um, <clears throat> brings conviction to people's heart or it um, is probably one of the most offensive scriptures in the Bible to people that don't know God or don't want to know God. So I'm thankful. Um, that's a scripture that has been a part of my life for a long time, but it, it's going to be a new part, a different part, and I'm looking forward to that. And the other thing I wanted to share before we started this morning was... Um, Matthew uh, 6, 9, and um, the precursor to this scripture is, um, I'll give just a, a little bit before that, and when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. And this is how you should pray. And if you'd like to join with me, that's fine. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. 
Amen.
There. Woo. <laughs> like to wish a happy birthday to our daughter, Debbie. She has a birthday today, so. <clears throat> I'm going to speak to you this morning on facing discouragement. And the question we'll be looking at is, how can I avoid discouragement and keep pressing ahead in my own impossible situation? And we're going to continue the uh, series in the book of Nehemiah. So if you would open your Bibles or your iPad or whatever you're using to follow along in the Scriptures, Turn to Nehemiah chapter 2, and the portion that we'll be looking at is from verse 11 until the end of the chapter. And to get us up to speed a little bit, uh, uh, Nehemiah was given permission to return to his homeland, to Jerusalem, and to see what he could do about the ruins and the destruction in the city of uh, Jerusalem. And so uh, as we begin our reading here, we find him coming back to his homeland uh, to uh, face that situation. And I'm going to back up and, and start at verse 9. So uh, if you will follow along with me. If you haven't found Nehemiah yet, look for Chronicles, and then after that comes Ezra, and then Nehemiah. I'm going to start at verse 9, so follow along. So I went to the governors of trans euphrates and gave them the king's letters. The king had also sent army officers and cavalry with me. When Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official heard about this, they were very much disturbed that someone had come to promote the welfare of the Israelites. I went to Jerusalem, and after staying there three days, now I'll stop right there for just a second. He had just made a trip of 800 miles, and... Uh, Apparently, he, he was riding an animal, a mule or a horse, because uh, as he visits the city of Jerusalem, he's, he's mounted on some kind of animal. And uh, after 800 miles of riding on the back of whatever it was, I imagine he needed those three days to, to rest. Uh, and then he goes on, I set out during the night with a few men. I had not told anyone what my God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. There were no mounts with me except the one I was riding on. By night I went through the valley gate toward the jackal well and the dung gate, examining the walls of Jerusalem which had been broken down and its gates which had been destroyed by fire. Then I moved on toward the fountain gate and the king's pool, but there was not enough room for my mount to get through. So I went up the valley by night, examining the wall. Finally, I turned back and re-entered through the valley gate. The officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing because as yet they ha I had said nothing to the Jews or the priests or the nobles or officials or any others who would be doing the work. Then I said to them, You see the trouble we are in. Jerusalem lies in ruins, and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the walls of Jerusalem and we will no longer be in disgrace. 
I also told them about the gracious hand of God upon me and what the king has said to me. They replied, let's start building. So they began this good work. But when Sanballat the Horonite, Tobiah the Ammonite official, and Geshem the Arab heard about it, they mocked and ridiculed us. What is this that you're doing? They asked. Are you rebelling against the king? I answered them by saying, The God of heaven will give us success. We, his servants, will start rebuilding. But as for you, you have no share in Jerusalem or any claim or historic right to it. Let's pray before we look at this this passage. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful, first of all, for Jesus and what he means to us. And Lord, today as we open your word, we just pray that we will open our hearts to receive what you have for us today. I ask, O oh God, that you would speak through me. Help me to deliver the message that you have given to me, I pray. And I ask, O oh God, that it might find a place in our hearts and that we might be encouraged to go on in spite of all the uh, negative circumstances around us. We thank you for it, Lord, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, as, uh, as Nehemiah looked over the city, I'm sure that he found enough in the ruins of that city to discourage him and maybe uh, want, have him to want to return to his own uh, place. But there are three things I, I, as I look over this passage that could have discouraged him. First of all, the appalling amount of rubble that he found in, in Jerusalem. There's one area of the city that he couldn't even get through because of the, the rubble and the ruin. Uh, now, we uh, just moved here about five months ago, and, and we had lived for 17 years in the same place. Now, that's not a very long, play, a long time, but 17 years was enough time to... Uh, together, uh, I don't know how many piles of junk we, we sent to the dump. I couldn't believe how much junk we had accumulated in 17 years. Now, before that, as we were missionaries, every fifth year, we had to pack up our stuff and come home on furlough. And then after furlough, we had to store our stuff and pack up and, and head back. And so we always were able to get rid of a lot of junk. But in 17 years, the, it, we found in our house a lot of ruin and junk that we had to get lit rid of. Well, as, as Nehemiah went throughout the city, he found the, the, uh, the situation to be almost impossible. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, the second thing that I find that could have discouraged him was the apparent apathy of those living in Jerusalem. Now, the first group of uh, Jews that had returned from exile ha had gone back about a hundred years before this time. So many of them had lived there all of their lives, or almost all of their lives. <clears throat> and uh, even before Nehemiah was born, that first group had, had returned, and then another group had come back about 15 years before. And, uh, and yet, the city still laid in ruins. It, they had done very little about... Their, their sad situation. Uh, the inhabitants had been living there for 
at least 70 years or all their life, and, and yet the, the city remained in the same situation. Yes, they had rebuilt their temple, but it was very inferior to the original temple, and it took them a long time to do that. <laughs> and we notice as you read the story that later on in this book, you'll find that a lot of the nobles could care less about rebuilding the, the city. It, it says that they, they didn't want to even lay a hand on, on the work. A, and so the, the apathy, the apparent apathy of, of the inhabitants was also something that could have discouraged Nehemiah. The third thing were the, was the antagonizing animosity, I'll get it out, the antagonizing animosity of Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem. Verse 19 says, When Sanballat the Horonite, Tobiah the Ammonite official, and Geshem the Arab heard about it, they mocked and ridiculed us. What is this you're doing, they ask? Are you rebelling against the king? Now, if you have the King James Version, it says they laughed us to scorn and despised us. They laughed us to, to scorn and despised us. Now, words can hurt. Words can uh, discourage. They can even destroy a person. On the other hand, uh, words can heal, they can encourage, and they can build up. But in these ca this case, they were hurtful words. Uh, they laughed us to scorn. Now, James says, speaking of the, the tongue, the instrument we use to, uh, to, to express our words, he says, with the tongue we praise our Lord and, and Father, and with it we curse men. Uh, and he goes on, he says, uh, we curse men who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers, this should not be. Now even words expressed in, with, with good intention can sometimes be taken the wrong way. Uh, we lost our oldest daughter in, in El Salvador when she was almost 13 years of age. She died of some kind of tropical virus and it happened the first of the year. It was uh, in, in the night when the people were celebrating the coming of the new year, and we were facing with the loss of our daughter. Now, we received many letters of encouragement, of con that, uh, words that consoled us and encouraged us from many hundreds of letters that we received from people uh, from our supporting churches. But there was one letter where the person said, now, if there had just been someone there with enough faith to pray for her healing, she wouldn't have died. Now, that night, our churches in El Salvador would celebrate all night long with a, a prayer vigil and, and preaching. And, uh, and so there were th hundreds of churches that were gathered uh, to, to do that. And our, our executive leaders sent letters knowing what we were going through. They sent, let, uh, sent telegrams. Now, that was back in the day when you used a telegram uh, to communicate. They sent telegrams to the churches. They called pastors. And, and there were hundreds of people that were praying for our daughter. Surely, there would have been at least one or two people with faith. But what, what I'm saying is I'm sure this person had good intentions when they wrote this. But it, it hurt. It hurt. 
because of, of the words. And so even with good intentions sometimes, our words can be mis, uh, misinterpreted and, and taken wrong. But here, this, the, the antagonizing animosity of these, of these uh, three uh, and their words surely were enough to discourage Nehemiah. Now, it has been observed that as Christians, we're either in the midst of a battle or just emerging from a battle or headed into one. Now, I don't know where you're at in your experience, but I'm sure that this is very true. Rarely do we bask in the flowery meadows of peace. Perhaps in heaven we'll, we'll enjoy that. But here on earth, the Bible ta tells us that we will have trouble and face times of discouragement. A lot of us have been praying for revival. A and we think that if revival comes... That'll be the end of our problems. But the truth is that'll probably be the front end of our problems. Because the truth is that it's a simple fact of life that when God opens the windows of heaven to bless us, the devil opens up the doors of hell to blast us. Uh, when God begins moving... The devil fires up all his artillery. Whenever we as individuals or as a church face a problem that is spiritual in nature, uh, there's going to be some Sanballats and Tobias and Geshems. Maybe they'll have different names, but there are going to be some that will rise up and, and throw great discouragement and say, it's impossible. It can't be done. You just can't do it. Well, my question is, should we fold up and, and go away? No. God did not call us to fail, but to be victorious. The death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ established our victory. We have the victory when we learn how to face our times of trouble and discouragement. And this passage that we're looking at in Nehemiah provides a perfect example of how to keep pressing ahead in the face of insurmountable uh, circumstances. So let's look at this question. How can I avoid discouragement and keep pressing ahead in my own impossible situation. First of all, we need to understand the basics. Understand the basics. My wife had an aunt. She's, uh, she passed away quite a few years ago now. But uh, her, her name was Bernita, but we knew her as Auntie B. And Auntie B was quite a, quite a character. Uh, I remember when she was in her 90s. She was in her 90s. She broke her ankle, and uh, she had recovered from that, and, but was still kind of hobbling around. We went to see her, and uh, she wanted to take us out to a restaurant to eat. And so uh, we went out to the car, and I opened the door for her, I reached to, to help her into the car, and she stood up and says, I can do it myself, thank you. And, uh, I mean, she was that kind of a person. The, the doctor wanted to give her a handicap sticker, but she, she rebelled. She says, I'm not invalid. I can do it. I can take care of myself. Well, we might have that attitude sometimes concerning our circumstances. But sooner or later, we're going to find us in a situation where we can't. We just can't face it. 
So the first basic that we need to look at is you can't, but God can. I can't, but God can. Philippians 4.13 says, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. I can do everything but through him, through Christ who gives me strength. Now, for Nehemiah, the task of rebuilding looked insurmountable, but his confidence was in God. He says in verse 20, the God of heaven will give us success. God will give us success. Success did not depend on Nehemiah's ability, his talents, or his resources. He was a very talented man. He, he, was, uh, he, he was a great leader, as we find as we go through this book. But it did not, his success did not depend on his own ability. Uh, Paul said in 2 Corinthians 4, 7, But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. The second thing that we need to do, the basics, is be assured that God wants to help us. God wants to help us. Psalm 34, verse 19, a righteous man may have many troubles, but the Lord delivers him from them all. So understand not only that you can't, but God can. Understand also that God wants to help you. And the third thing is to cry out for help. Now, I know that these are the no-brainers of my message. I mean, this is what we should do first. But it seems like, if you're like me at least, when all else fails, oh, maybe I should pray. <laughs> maybe I should ask for help. Uh, be assured that God wants to help you, so cry out for help. Now, I notice one thing about Nehemiah that, that uh, just stood out to me. When, when he went before the king, you remember he, he had a sad face because he had heard what had happened to his city and, and the, what condition it was in. And uh, the king said, you know, your face, you, you, you look sad. What's wrong? And so he told him. And then the king says, what is it you want? Now, in that moment, and this is found in, in verses 4 and 5 in Nehemiah chapter 2, it says, the king said to me, what is it you want? And this phrase is the one that just stands out to me. It says, then I prayed to the God of heaven, and I answered the king. Now, notice he didn't say, uh, King, let, let me go. I'll, I'll go and, and uh, I'll have a prayer vigil and, 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 and pray about this, and then I'll answer you. No, it, it was in the moment. He, he had to give an answer. He had to say something. So he says, I, I prayed to the Lord, of, or to the God of heaven. I, I don't know how many times in my 80, 83 years I have found myself in a situation where I didn't have time to say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. All I could say was, Help! <laughs> I need help right now, God. Come and help me. And... Uh, Various times we'll find in this same book, in, his, in the story of Nehemiah, when he faced other situations, we find the same phrase, then I prayed to the God of heaven. In that moment, Lord, help me. I need to give an answer. I need to face this situation, whatever it was. Uh, 
Psalm 34, verse 17, the psalmist says, the righteous cry out and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all their troubles. So in order to avoid discouragement in our walk with the Lord, we need to recognize that we can't, but God can. We need to recognize that God wants to help us, and then we need to cry out to him. These are the basics. The second thing that I learned from this story in, in chapter 2 of Nehemiah is that to stop believing the lies about adversity. First of all, there are those that will tell you that when adversity comes, that's not normal. Or that's normal. No, not normal, rather. I'll get it straight here. Uh, that it, th th that's not normal. You shouldn't have, as a Christian, you shouldn't have to face times of adversity. But in reality, it is normal. Now, we moved here five months ago, and I was thanking the Lord that we were leaving the rain behind over there on the, the, the other side of the mountains. Thank the Lord we won't have to face all that rain. And then it rained. <laughs> and then it rained, and then it rained here. And so the, the, everyone is telling us it's not normal. It's not normal. Now, I have traveled. I've been in Cuba. I've been in other islands of the Caribbean. I've been in every country of Central America and most of the countries in South America. And it seems like wherever I go, whenever there's kind of strange weather, the people tell me it's not normal. <laughs> so I'm wondering if there is normal weather anywhere. Well, here uh, it says, uh, many will say, well, it's not normal. But in reality, it is normal. Jesus said in John chapter 13, uh, 16, verse 33, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. Now, he should have stopped right there. If what many tell us is true, then that's where he should have stopped. But he didn't stop there. He went on, in this world you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. In this world, you'll have trouble. And then Paul, writing to Timothy, in chapter 3 of 2 Timothy, verses 12 and 13, in fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus, how many of you want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus? Well, look at what it says, will be persecuted. You'll have trouble. You'll have trouble. And then it goes on, while evil men and imposters will go from bad to worse. In other words, it's not going to get any better. As time goes on, it won't get any better. They, they'll go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. De, being deceived. So it's, it's normal. Trouble is normal. We will face it in our walk with the Lord. The second thing is, it's expected. It's expected. 1 Peter 4, 12. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful trial you are suffering, as though something strange were happening to you. Uh, don't be surprised. It's expected. They don't surprise God. Troubles do not surprise God. He doesn't say, I didn't see that coming. But, and so God says to us, don't be surprised if you face troubles because it is expected. And then, and this is a strange one, it's purposeful. It has a purpose. 
Look at 2 Corinthians 4, 16 to 18. Therefore, we do not lose heart. In other words, we don't get discouraged. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us. Now notice that word achieving. That means doing something. They're doing something for us. Uh, For are achieving for us an eternal glory that outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. So Paul is saying that every moment of our struggle, of the troubles we face, are are meaningful. It has meaning. It's doing something. It's causing something. It's bringing about something glorious. In other words... We are to look at trouble as, as, as a blessing in disguise. Now, I know that's, that, that, that's strange. But look at trouble as a blessing in disguise. Paul also tells us that our troubles are temporary, light and momentary troubles. But Paul, you don't know what I'm going through. It's not very light. And it seems like it's going on forever. Uh, But they are momentary in comparison to eternity. Uh, Now, the year 2020 had one extra day, but I think they snuck a bunch of extra days in there because it seemed like that year would never end. And there were days that I'm sure had more than 24 hours. You know, when you're sitting at home, not being able to go out, the time just stretches. And it seemed to me that there were days, many days, that had maybe 36 hours instead of 24. But Paul says here that Our troubles are temporary. They don't go on forever. And in comparison to to what awaits us in in glory, there there, there just isn't any comparison. He says in Romans 8, 18, I consider that the present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. God does not allow problems to come to you to hurt you. He does not allow problems to come to you to hurt you, but to build you up. (coughs) Recognize then that adversity is normal, it's expected, and it's purposeful. So the third thing to avoid discouragement and not give up or give in, or give out, is to learn to handle adversity like Nehemiah. Let's see what he did in order to uh, avoid discouragement. First of all, when faced with adversity, Nehemiah recalled what God had done for him in the past. He told those that were going along with him Uh, viewing the city and the ruins and all that. He says, I also told them about the gracious hand of my God upon me and what the king has said to me. He was looking back at what God had done for him in the past and, and looking back and remembering how God pulled us through the tough times serves to renew the heart in faith and hope, and strength, and joy. So when we're faced with a problem today, we need to look back and see how God pulled us through in many times, in many many situations. 
Now the truth is, if we never had problems, most likely we would not seek the Lord like we should. Uh, name the times when you've grown the most in the Lord. But be honest. When everything was fine, when everything was peaceful, when everything was going your way, I would suspect that no. God was nearest and most real to you when you agonized in prayer and when you found him to be faithful. That's the times when you have grown the most. Now there's a wonderful principle in this. What God has done in the past is a model and a promise of what he will do in the future. But we need to realize that he's too creative to do the same thing the same way twice. So if God has delivered you from a certain situation in a certain way, don't expect him to do it the same way the next time because he's the creator God and he's too creative to do it the same way the second time or the third time. So when faced with adversity, remember how God rescued you yesterday, the day before, or whenever, and know that he will do it again. The second thing I see in this story is when faced with adversity, Nehemiah placed total trust in what God could do. He said to those three men who scoffed and, and accused him of, of going against the word of the king, he said, the God of heaven will give us success. Now, when mocked and ridiculed by Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem, Nehemiah could have called their attention to the, the fact that he had the total backing of the king of Persia, that he had sent a military escort with him and military officials, and he had the edict the letters from the king. He could have called their attention to that. But no, his confidence was not in the king of Persia, but in the king of kings and lord of lords. My God will give us success. Not what we might have, but what God uh, can do. Now, uh, over a hundred years before, the first wave of, uh, of exiles returned to Jerusalem from, uh, from Babylonia. And God said to the leader of that group, that first group that returned, it was a man by the name of Zerubbabel. Can you ever imagine giving your kid that name? Zerubbabel, come here. Well, uh, Zerubbabel was the leader of that group. And God's word to him was this. Uh, and it's found in Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6. So he said to me, this is the word of God, to, uh, of the Lord, to Zerubbabel. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. So when we're faced with discouraging situations, remember who is behind us, who is <coughs> for us. It's the Lord Almighty. I found a quote by Corey Ten Boom. She says this, if you look at the world, you'll be distressed. And boy, if you look at our world today, it's enough to distress anyone. If you look at the world, you'll be distressed. If you look within, you'll be depressed. If you look at Christ, you'll be at rest. If you look at Christ, <laughs> you'll be at rest. So when faced with your sandballots 
or Tobias or Geshem's or whatever their name is. Uh, put your trust in the one that can give you victory. The third thing that I learn in this story uh, of how Nehemiah faced adversity is that when he was faced with adversity, <coughs> Nehemiah wasn't about to give up. He wasn't about to give in. He wasn't about to opt out. He says in verse 20, we, his servants, will start rebuilding. We're going to go ahead in the name of the Lord. He was saying, we will keep pressing on no matter what. He had traveled 800 miles from Persia to Jerusalem to do God's work. And he wasn't going to let a little adversity discourage him. He had work to do. And he was going to do it. I've used this before I, in, in one of the uh, uh, videos that I uh, did for the church. But it's Psalm 23, verse 4, and I've kind of taken this as my, my motto. Uh, it says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Now, I've read this at, at funerals. Uh, and I've read it to console people that have lost uh, loved ones. Uh, and we, we usually think of it, you know, this is for a person that's maybe facing, facing death or has gone through it. Well... I don't think that's its intent. I think what the, the psalmist was saying is that when I find myself in the deepest, darkest situation, I'm going to keep walking because I know who is with me. And I think that's the idea there. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, the, the darkest, deepest situation that I could face in my life, I'm just going to keep right on walking. Walk through, for me, is the, the, the clue there. I'm going to walk through the valley of the shadow of death because I know that God is with me. So the message for us this morning is keep pressing on no matter what. Uh, 2020 was bad, but we don't know what 2021 is going to bring us. If we look at the situation, political situation, for example, uh, that our nation finds itself in, uh, it, it doesn't look all that great. But we're going to keep on because the Lord is with us. So as we close this morning, I, I want you to make that same determination with me. We may face deep, dark, distressing situations this coming year, but we're going to walk through because God is with us. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for your word and for the promises of your word. And help us, O oh God, as we uh, look at this story, we just pray that we will take something with us this morning that will, we can apply to our lives and that we will be encouraged and lifted up. We thank you for speaking to us, O oh God, in this service. We thank you for each one who has come to the, this house to worship you, and I just pray a special blessing over each one in the name of Jesus Christ. We ask in that name, that powerful name of our Lord, amen. God bless you. I don't know if they're going to be singing or
your grace abounds in deepest waters, your sovereign grace will be my guide. What fear may fail and fear surrounds me, you've never Thank you, Glenn, for an inspiring message this morning. Um, there's a lot to learn. Uh, one of the things that I've learned is that 
And the, the word says that, is that God's word is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. Divides the, the, the bone and the marrow in, the, in our, our heart's condition. And um, thankful for the word, just rich with scripture. And thanks, Glenn. You know, it's just um, what the Lord does in our lives. Um, with the prayer, the, the, the Lord's Prayer, we were at a church um, over the last few months, and uh, <clears throat> they left off the last part of the Lord's Prayer, the one that says, To thine be the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. I was shocked, and then I started reading some uh, versions of the Bible, and they leave that out. It's amazing. I, it just, uh, the whole thing triggered something in my heart. But, you know, all the Lord brings us through, it's for his glory. And uh, we just can't leave off the last part of the Lord's Prayer. To thine be the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Let's just close in a word of prayer. <clears throat> we thank you, Lord, that you're so available that our prayer can be, help me, help me now, Lord, should be the first thing um, out, of our, out, out, out of our hearts and through our lips, Lord, that we pray to you in situations that we need you. Such a loving Father, you are so gracious and to meet our needs and be our strength. And we know that, and as we walk through the years with you, we look back and we see those times when we couldn't have done it on our own. And so, to thine be the glory and the power. It's all about you, Lord. Thank you for what you do in our lives. And fathers, we uh, just focus on you this year. Um, may our faith and our trust be without borders. May there be no end to the, uh, the faith that we put in you, Lord. Because we can always expect a good outcome. Your loving Father, and we give you praise this morning. We pray your blessing on each and every one here, their travels home, the remainder of their day, the coming week. And uh, Lord, just um, we call out to you for the year 2021. And we're saying, help, Lord. Help us with this new year that we might trust you more. As we leave here today, we just thank you and we pray a blessing on everyone and uh, go in God's grace. Amen.